Ryzen is here guys, and I am exhausted. The last few days have been a whirlwind of testing, swapping out components, testing again, updating the UEFI, testing again, trying to get memory to work at rated speeds, testing again, rinse and repeat. I'm glad to say though, that I now have enough data to draw some fairly significant conclusions, and I wanna share it all with you guys right now. This is my review of the AMD Ryzen 7 1800X and R7 1700. So I know that 95% of the people that watch these videos watch it for the benchmarks. So we're gonna to get to those straight away. But first, let me preface the upcoming deluge of information with the following. One, I've separated out these results into three separate categories. The interesting, the boring, and the ugly. We're gonna start with the boring and work our way through to the other two categories, discussing our results along the way. Two. I ran my tests with four different processors, with the 7700K and 6900K from Intel joining the party along with the two new Ryzen SKUs. Tests were run at stock speeds as well as high, but not teetering on the brink of instability overclocks. For example, the 7700K was run at 5 GHz, which is well within reason for most users. The 6900K was run at 4.4 GHz, the 1800X hit 4.025 GHz, and the 1700 hit 4 GHz. Three, I suppose now would be the time to say that the Ryzen CPUs were, in fact, poor overclockers. Additionally, I ran into a few instability issues with the 1700, even at stock speeds, with crashes in Adobe Premiere during rendering. The 1700 was also giving me really funky boost numbers at times, with one core boosting while the other stayed at the base frequency. In the end, I managed to get what I feel are proper test results, but it did take a while. It's likely that all of this can and hopefully will be corrected with future BIOS revisions. These are, after all, first generation products with first generation motherboards, and we're all currently paying the early adopter penalty of being essentially beta testers at this point. Four, in the end, I ultimately chose to sidestep the memory issues I was having with my ASUS X370 Prime board and run my KB Lake and Ryzen test beds with the same kit of Corsair Vengeance LPX DDR4 2400 instead of trying to get my XMP profiles to work as they should with higher speed memory. Again, it's likely that this is something that can and will be addressed with future BIOS releases as it seems to be a widespread issue among reviewers. Five, the test setups were the following. The 6900K was running in a Gigabyte X99 Ultra Gaming motherboard with 16 gigs of Corsair Vengeance LPX DDR4 in a quad channel configuration. The 7700K was operating in an EVGA Z270 classified K motherboard and the Ryzen chips were jammed in an ASUS X370 Prime Pro, all with 16 gigs of Corsair memory as previously discussed. All systems were run off the same Patriot Ignite 480 gigabyte SSD. A Corsair H100i was used to cool the Intel chips and I started off my Ryzen benchmarks using the previous generation Wraith cooler. After realizing I probably needed to level the playing field slightly, I swapped that out for the Noctua NH-U14S, as my Corsair AM4 brackets have yet to show up, unfortunately. A GTX 1080 was used for some of the testing, and a Titan X Pascal was used for other portions. I'll explain more about that in one second. Number six. I ran a good portion of my testing using a GTX 1080 Founders Edition to accurately simulate a best case scenario for a power user. However, after running through a bunch of gaming benchmarks in 4K, I wanted to make sure that this CPU review was actually taxing the CPUs in question. This would give us a better understanding of relative performance. In order to do this, I had to artificially create a CPU bottleneck. The best way to do this was to swap out the 1080 for a Titan X and lower the resolution to 1440p. Now, why not 1080p? Well, I actually initially started to do this portion of the testing at 1080p, but found that the Titan X is so ridiculously powerful that I was more often than not running into frame rate caps in some benchmarks and games. For instance, Doom and Metro Last Light both cap at 200 frames per second, and with the Titan installed, the counter was pegged at 200 for both. So I increased the resolution to 1440p to drop the frame rate down somewhat, but also still make it so that our limiting factor was not in fact our GPU, but rather our CPU. Okay, so I think that's all the important information. Let's talk through some of the results. The first set of tests we're gonna look at is what I'll call the boring. 
This is my standard suite of gaming benchmarks. Heaven is, of course, a synthetic, but still functions much like a game would. The other tests here are actually all game engines, and these tests were all run at 4K at their maximum settings, ultra or very high. We see some fairly impressive results across the board here from all processors, with almost no discernible difference between really any of the chips in these tests. This is why I call this section boring. The limiting factor here was the GTX 1080. While still very powerful, it is the bottleneck in the chain at this resolution, as the CPU is sending more data to the GPU, yo, as the CPU is sending more data to the GPU than the GPU can process. As a result, these slides are actually all more indicative of the relative power of the GTX 1080 than the relative power of any particular processor. As such, we're just gonna move along here to the next section, which I will call the interest. Now these results will start to show some real measurable differences in the processors in our tests. We'll start off with everybody's favorite CPU test, Cinebench. Now Cinebench can be run in single core mode as well as multi-core. And of course, due diligence means doing both tests. Intel 7700K really comes out gun blazing here, showing off both its enormous advantage in IPC as well as its higher clock speeds. However, it's important to note that the Ryzen chips more than hold their own against the 6900K, a similarly configured eight core processor. When we turn on all the cores, the 7700K goes and hides in a corner while the big boys flex their muscles. The 6900K's huge boost it gains from a 700 megahertz overclock puts it at number one overall, but pay close attention to those impressive scores from the Ryzen chips, especially the $329.1700. Next up, we have 7-Zip, another synthetic CPU stressor. Again here, we see the obvious advantage the high core count chips enjoy over the 7700K as it gets pretty thoroughly trounced. The 6900K really pulls way ahead when overclocked, as the Ryzen chips struggle to even surpass the 6900K's performance at stock speeds. Geekbench is another single core and multi core benchmark which uses different computational tasks to aggregate a performance score. As is becoming a trend, and an important one for tests later on in this video, the single core performance king remains the 7700K. Both the 1800X and the 1700 are able to outpoint the 6900K at stock speeds, but the lack of overclocking on these chips hurt it after we boost everybody up and the 6900K comes out on top again. This is a situation where if you have ideal cooling and perhaps a better, more refined BIOS, higher overclocks may be possible and bigger performance gains should be realized, perhaps not too distant in the future. Next up, I let our combatants battle it out in a 4K export speed test in Adobe Premiere. I loaded up a 4K video clip from my latest review, added in some color correction, and let it render. The 1800X really shined again at stock clock speeds with the fastest overall time. Even the 1700 was not much slower than the 6900K. But when overclocked, the 1800X only gained 17 seconds, while the 1700 only gained 12 seconds. The 6900K, on the other hand, lopped a whopping 1 minute and 35 seconds off its time. Now, while the next two tests may seem like gaming benchmarks, because they both have specific CPU intensive sections and their overall scores vary accordingly, I left them in this portion of our results. Firestrike Ultra scores were fairly comparable across the board, although I have to say the 1700 really impressed me the most in this round. The 1800X actually achieved the highest overall score of the group, but the baby Ryzen chip was nipping at its heels with the second highest score, beating out the 6900K. That's impressive. Time Spy unfortunately didn't see a repeat of these results, as the 6900K kind of trounced everybody here. Both Ryzen chips clearly beat out the 7700K though, and turned in totally respectable scores. Now we're gonna move on to the ugly portion of our testing. This is where I swapped out our good friend GTX 1080 for our new and better friend, the Titan X Pascal. I turned the resolutions down to 1440p and let some gaming benchmarks rip. Unigen Heaven was first up, and while we see the 7700K coming out on top, that's, I think, to be ex expected. All of our eight core chips here run at lower clock speeds, and even though there's a clear delta between them and the 7700K, it's not earth shattering. But in the division, we start to see the gap increase. The 1800X was lagging behind the 7700K by a full seven frames per second, and even trailed the 6900K by four. As we move on to Doom, Titanfall 2, and Metro Last Light, 
we start to see the gap widen into an actual chasm. Now keep in mind that the results we're seeing here should ultimately not affect your actual gameplay. The difference between gaming at 174 frames per second and 185 frames per second is almost imperceptible, so you won't be actively hurting your experience. However, these are significant performance deltas in popular games that cannot and should not be ignored. It's clear that AMD's marketing team was barking up the wrong tree, trying to go after the 7700K in gaming performance. Yes, certainly you can get a satisfactory gaming experience out of the 1700 and 1800X, but will you ever be able to match what a 7700K can do for you in Doom with one of these processors, even with UEFI updates and other optimization? Likely no. So let's wrap up with a few thoughts. The 1800X is a $500 chip that is most directly comparable to the $1,050 i7-6900K. Despite AMD's hype train and press event demos, it doesn't really outperform that chip in almost anything once we apply even a mild overclock. But let's look at it from a different angle. The 1800X costs half of what the 6900K costs. Add in the fact that optimal memory configuration for X370 is dual channel versus quad channel for X99 means that you're saving money there. The highest end X370 board costs $300 and is not even one that I'd really recommend at this time due to issues a lot of reviewers were having with it during testing. The most expensive board I'd recommend is the ASUS ROG Crosshair 6 Hero, which is only $250. The high end X99 motherboards cost $600 and there's more than one of those. So you're looking at a total platform cost that when all is said and done, leaves you enough room in your budget to also buy a GTX 1080 Ti for the same price you would have spent on just an Intel chip, memory, and motherboard. That's certainly something to consider. Never mind the fact that in heavy computational tasks, workstation applications, and video encoding, the 1800X is a certified workhorse. However, I don't think that it's even the right call for the majority of people. The R7 1700 will give you 90 to 95% of the performance of the 1800X and do it for a price that's less than the 7700K. This is the world's first eight core 16 threaded CPU that I would genuinely call an absolute bargain. The $170 price premium you pay for an 1800X is just not worth it at this time. The 1700 is the real gem of the Ryzen lineup and one that's currently being overshadowed by the more flashy SKUs that end in X. Don't be fooled. If you want eight cores of processing power and budget is at all a consideration, don't look any further than right here. Now let's just touch briefly on gaming. If you're the type of person who literally does nothing with your computer, except respond to evites, browse Amazon, check email, and game with your bros, feel free to skip the Ryzen lineup entirely. Intel's offerings are still just too good at this time at those tasks to bother switching over to the red team. Even though it wasn't included in this comparison, I would venture to say that it's likely even the i5-7600K would outperform the 1800X in strictly gaming tests. Ryzen's real value comes to those who use their machines for multiple purposes. Maybe you're a Twitch streamer who needs the extra cores to offload some of the encoding. Maybe you're a photographer or a videographer who needs to edit and then blow off some steam fragging demons. Maybe you're like me and make mediocre YouTube videos. All those scenarios are why Ryzen exists as a platform. Ryzen is like your buddy who plays football, baseball, soccer, and hockey, and is pretty good at all of them. He's not the best in any one of them, but he's always welcome on your team, and he does good things when he's on the field. Plus, he's usually the one that brings the beer. Thanks for sticking around until the end of this extra long review video. I hope you guys like my take on Ryzen and what AMD is offering with its new line of chips. If you guys want more details on the Ryzen architecture, pricing, or special features, I've already covered those in previous videos, so I wasn't about to reiterate all that information. You could check out a couple videos that I've done linked in the video description. So if you guys like this video, please feel free to drop a comment down below and hit that little like button down there also. If you think I screw something up, well, I'm sure you'll also let me know about that as well. Thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you in the next video.